Come on, everybody say Acts. All right, if you got a Bible, go to Acts chapter one. Yes, we are starting a new series this weekend on the book of Acts. And I'm so pumped about it. I've, you know, this book has changed my life. Um, it is, it's the first book after the Gospels. It's page 991. <laughs> in case you're wondering, what page is this book in? It's in the Bible. Uh, but it is the story of how the church began. Right after Jesus went up to heaven, he gives these disciples, these 12 disciples, this mission, this you know, commandment, great commission to go and preach the gospel. But he says, wait for the power that's about to happen. And the book of Acts is all about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on the early church and how it just completely revitalized the world, changed Jerusalem, turned upside down cities and countries, and this is how Christianity spread. This is really the story of the church in the book of Acts, and it ends abruptly. We're going to notice that as we get to the end of this, I don't know how long we'll be in this series. There's 28 chapters here. We could be in this series for the next 28 weeks, um, but I, I really feel in my heart that God wants to speak to us, that God wants to speak directly to you and I. The things that they walked through are things that you and I are facing right now. We need truth. We need grace. We need wisdom. We need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And we're in a time where our world is confused. Our world is, um, there's wars. There's rumors of wars. There's all kinds of things going on. Um, there's, there's a, there really is a spirit of confusion in our society. And the book of Acts interrupted all the confusion and brought truth and brought the hope of Jesus Christ. And it was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So... In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, Luke, the author, who was a doctor, he wasn't one of the disciples that walked with Jesus, but he was one who came later on, and he heard about all these stories, and he started writing. Um, he wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the book of Acts, and he was writing to this young uh, believer, Theophilus, and he said, I wrote to you about all that Jesus began to do and teach in my last book. Until Jesus was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After Jesus had suffered, he, was, uh, he made himself visible to his disciples. For the next 40 days, he presented him, himself to them, and he gave convincing proofs that he was alive. We talked about one of these moments last week when Jesus showed up on the beach with Peter, and he had breakfast with Peter. And we talked about how he restored Peter and gave Peter, you know, this commandment to go and feed the sheep and to go and preach the gospel. Um, Jesus would show up to his disciples multiple times after he rose from the dead. He showed his scars to Thomas. He showed where they had nailed his hands and his feet. He showed up on the road to Emmaus, two guys who were walking towards Jerusalem. And they were talking how confusing these last few weeks had been in Jerusalem and how they didn't know how to make sense of what they had just experienced. How many of you guys have been there before where you don't know how to make sense of what you've just experienced? Half of us in the room. The other half, you're still in a place. You're so dazed and confused. You're like, I still don't know what's going on. What's, where am I? You know, who brought me here? Um, <laughs> and, and these guys were confused. And Jesus is walking right with them in the middle of their confusion. And their confusion doesn't just leave, he just begins to answer their questions. He begins speaking to them. And they're sitting down, they're having breakfast, and all of a sudden he's gone, and they realize that was Jesus that was with us. Well, this happened multiple times where he showed up after the resurrection and gave convincing proof that he was alive. And then it says this, on one occasion, in verse 4, while he was eating with the disciples, he gave them this commandment. This is before he goes up to heaven. He says, do not leave Jerusalem. And I want to stop right there. The fact that he would say these words means that they wanted to leave. <laughs> they wanted to leave Jerusalem because they had been hurt in Jerusalem. They had messed up in Jerusalem. They had, they had experienced the most pain in Jerusalem. They had good times in Galilee. They had good times in, in Nazareth. They had good times in, in other towns, Jericho. But Jerusalem, that was the place they experienced their greatest letdown. That's where they watched their Savior die on a cross. That's where they themselves betrayed him. They experienced not only their biggest disappointment, they experienced their biggest shame. And Jesus says, I want you to stay in the place that you've experienced the most pain because where the devil has tried to strike you the hardest, I'm about to bring a blow to the kingdom of darkness like never before. Where the devil tried to stop you, I'm going to launch you. 
where the devil thought he had this movement and he was going to contain it, I'm about to explode it. Did you know when a poisonous snake bites you, the only cure to that poison that's inside you is going to come from that actual poisonous snake? The anti-venom comes from the venom. Ebola is cured from Ebola. And in the same way, Jerusalem was a, almost like a poisonous attack against the disciples because it was where all the prophets went to die. It's where everyone, I mean, it was the most religious city. Religion is, all, religion is toxic. It's all about, you know, for them, uh, the people in the temple during that time, they couldn't stand the message of Jesus because it was about relationship. He was inviting people to know God without trying to perform, you know, a bunch of good deeds in order to get close to God, but simply just to call on him. That God so loved the world, he gave his son. Jesus came not to establish religion, but relationship with us. And Jesus was telling them, I want you to stay in Jerusalem, the place that's so wrapped up in religiosity, we're about to break the spirit of religion off this city. We're about to flip this city upside down, and they're about to be, they're going to they're gonna find Jesus through your movement if you stay here. He says, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay in the mission that God's called you to stay in. Stay till you see the breakthrough. I was sitting in traffic not too long ago, and um, it was so backed up on Highway 75. And the lane right next to me starts moving, and I was like, ah, I need to be in that lane. That lane's moving faster. Those people are going somewhere. The sun is shining on that lane. The grass is greener in that lane, you know? You ever looked at someone else's lane and thought, their lane is better than your lane? You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, they, must, they, they got the secret sauce. What are they doing in order to go faster than us? And uh, so I start to move over. And right when I move over, that lane slows down and my lane starts moving. I'm like, guys, let me back in. They're like, no, you left us. You don't get to come back over here. You know, people become like super territorial in those lanes. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And this is what the Holy Spirit's saying. Stay in the lane that I've called you to run in because there's power coming. Don't get your eyes off your mission. Stay in the mission that God's called you to. Stay in the marriage God's called you to. Stay in the ministry God's called you to. Stay in the upper room of prayer. Jesus was saying, don't you leave Jerusalem from a place of hurt. You stay right here because this is where your healing's gonna happen. And not just for you, but it's going to spread like wildfire. It's going to start here, but it's going to go into Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The same place that you experienced your letdown, you're about to experience your breakthrough. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. Everybody say, wait for it. Did you know that the average human being spends 14 years of their life waiting? Some of y'all this week, you spent hours waiting in traffic, waiting in line, at a grocery store, waiting on the phone for somebody to answer. They put you on hold. How many of y'all just can't stand being put on hold by people? You know what I'm saying? You're like, don't you put me on hold? Like, I'm going to put you on hold. No, don't. I'm gonna, I'm, I can't control. They put me on hold. And we wait. We wait, we wait, we wait. But there is a way to wait passively, and there's a way to wait actively. How you wait is just as important as what you're waiting for. Jesus wasn't telling them to wait with a bad attitude. He wasn't telling them to wait and go, one of these days, he's going to finally bring his promise to pass. One of these days, I'll get married. One of these days, we'll have kids. One of these days, I'm going to be free from this addiction. One of these days, my kids are going to come back to the Lord. One of these days... He wasn't saying to wait with wishful thinking. He was saying wait with a fervency. Wait with prayer. Wait with worship. Wait with tithing. Wait with obedience. Wait by showing up to the upper room. Every single time your brothers are up there, you get your booty up there, shut the door, and pray. Stop waiting with a passive attitude and start waiting with a fervent spirit. I just offended some religious people in the room. They're like, he just said booty in here. I don't know if I can come back to church. He said booty in here. Well, listen, you know what? It doesn't matter. There's a whole lot of buts in the Bible. <laughs> and here's what I know, is that if we will wait with a fervent spirit, if we'll wait, he says, wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was saying, wait and pray. And while you're waiting and praying, Prepare, stir up your expectancy. Holy Spirit, speak to us right now, God. Stir up our expectancy for you to move. 
God, I pray, Lord, that whatever people are waiting on right now, you know people are waiting on big things and little things. Some people are waiting on direction. Some people are waiting on wisdom. Some people are waiting on a relationship to turn around. Some people are waiting, God, for their spouse. Some people are waiting for a miracle in their body, a miracle in their marriage. Some people are waiting, God, for healing to happen. I pray that today, God, you would arrest our hearts to wait, God, not from a lazy spirit, but, Lord, an active spirit. God, that we would be spiritually activated believers and that we would wait with prayer and expectancy in Jesus' name. He says, wait on the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is part of the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three in one. God reveals himself through the Holy Spirit, even in the book of Genesis, chapter one. The Spirit hovered over the water. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. Spirit, Holy Spirit in the Hebrew means ruach, which means the very wind or the breath. In the, in the Greek, it's called pneuma, which is a breeze, a breath that comes from God. Some of us in this room, we need to check our breath. Turn to that person next to you and say, check your breath. What kind of spirit are you operating in? There's a lot of believers that are not moving in a, a Holy Spirit-empowered life. We're moving in a, some sort of a spirit. But the Holy Spirit produces fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, goodness. The Holy Spirit energizes us. You can tell a believer that's filled with the Holy Spirit, they're moving with purpose. They're moving with energy. They're moving with strength. Right now, the enemy has tried to exhaust the church, tried to make believers just walk around tired all the time. I need more espresso, espresso, whatever you call it. I need more coffee. How many shots of espresso did you have today? Four. I need eight. I need 10. I need, I need my fourth cup of coffee. It's 10 a.m. I'm tired. I need, to, I need more creatine. I need more strength from the weight room. I need another protein shake. Listen, the Holy Spirit can give to you the power that no coffee, no protein shake can give you, no, no diet here on earth. There is a power and an energy and a vitality that comes. You could go on vacation for weeks and still be tired. See, the real power doesn't come from what the world can offer. It comes from what the Holy Spirit can bring. He says, wait on the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're going to do things in your own strength. See, Jesus knew these disciples, they were going to preach. These were ordinary men. They had not graduated from a, a great university like Oral Roberts University, if you're an ORU grad today. Shout out to all the ORU grads. Hey, is anyone here this weekend that's from out of town? Can we just give a big hand clap for any families that are from out of town? Maybe you're visiting. If you are, stand up. I wanna, I wanna just honor those of you that are here from out of town. I know we got our friends Dennis and Colleen Rouse from Atlanta, Georgia, pastors, leaders. Come on, give all these families a big hand. Thanks for joining us today. So glad to have y'all from out of town. But the thing I love, the story of Acts is that these were men and women who were not extraordinary in the eyes of others. They didn't have graduate degrees from the temple universities in Israel. They were not from big families with a lot of money. These were fishermen. These were guys who cut dudes' ears off. These were messed up people. You go, well, hold on. These were really good people. No, they were just saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Don't try to polish the disciples because then you eliminate God using broken people with issues. How many are thankful that God uses broken people with issues? Come on, this is my service right here. Where's my broken? Come on, how many of y'all got some issues? And God still uses you. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. Jesus was using, and he knew, in order for you to move in power, it's not going to come from what man can give to you. It's not going to come from how good you've been, how much good things you've done. It's only going to come through the power. Korayeke shambayeke. The power of the Holy Spirit. What language is he talking? I'm talking the language of heaven. God wants to restore a lost language in the church. It's 2022. It's about time that churches our size start speaking in tongues a whole lot more. 
Now hold on, Paul. You're going to scare off all the new people. No, the new people need something different than what the world offers. They're going to the liquor store, the spirits. They haven't found what they're looking for. But when you come into church, he's pouring drinks. He's about to, come on, God's got something fresh for you today. God wants you to move in power today. God wants his church to get strong again. God wants believers to start walking in a greater maturity. God wants people to know there's a church that's moving like the book of Acts again. When I was younger, I remember my mom and dad, they baptized me. I was in Royal Rangers, and they were doing water baptism, and, and we came downstairs from Royal Rangers, and I got baptized. I came out of the water, and my dad said, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? I said, yes. He said, it's for every believer. I said, yes. And he said, you know, the Holy Spirit, there's evidence of the Holy Spirit that can happen in your life. I said, tell me about it. You know, he says, prophecy and discernment, wisdom, speaking in tongues, faith. He starts talking to me about the gifts of the Spirit. He says, do you want that, Paul? I said, yes, I want that. It's free. It's a gift for any believer who wants it. It's not just contained to certain families or certain people or just pastors or missionaries. It's for the back row to the front row. It's for any seat in the house, anyone watching online from Russia, Ukraine, China, wherever you're watching from, West Virginia, wherever you're at, God wants to give you the gifts of the Spirit. And this is what we need in this hour. We need power from on high. Because we're facing things that are beyond our understanding. How many of y'all have walked through something that's beyond your understanding in the last year? And you're going, I don't even know what to do with this. I don't know how to interpret this. I've done everything I can in the natural, and it is still beyond me. Who's been there before? I've been there. And I wept. I wept in the last year. Going, God, I don't understand. When I don't understand, this is where I've got to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit because he searches and knows all things. He's the, he's, he was there before Google was. He's greater than Elon Musk. He's greater than Twitter. He's greater than, he's greater than Facebook. He's greater than Zuckerberg. He knows all things. And he searches the hearts and the motives of every person. And when it's beyond your understanding, that's when you need to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit and say, I don't know what to do here, but Lord, my hope is in you. And I'm asking you to give me the interpretation. Show me what I'm to do. Give me the strength. The Holy Spirit not only energizes you, he encourages you when you're discouraged. Any believer in the room that you felt the encouragement of the Holy Spirit when you just were tired and sad and discouraged? Yeah. I mean, even yesterday, I was just, I, like, for whatever reason, just an emotion hit me yesterday. And I just started praying. I was crying. I was praying. I was by myself. And, and I was in my car. And as I was praying and crying, it was just like the Holy Spirit just began encouraging me. This is what David did in 1 Samuel 30. He encouraged himself in the Lord when he was exhausted, when he was tired. And you know, I think, I think um, churches like Victory, there's going to be a surge of the Holy Spirit. As I was praying over this series, I just felt like the Lord said, it's time for victory to dive into the book of Acts. And it's time for what, what, there's things in this book that God wants to happen right now in our church. Jesus said, wait, the Holy Spirit's going to come. In a few days, you're going to be baptized. The Holy, I want to tell you a couple things the Holy Spirit does. Number one, the Holy Spirit enlightens your memories. He enlightens your memories. It's, you know, the enemy tries to almost cause a spiritual Alzheimer's on believers to forget what God has done, to forget what God has said, and, and to forget the names of God. Did you know that God has names for every season you walk through? I'm telling you what, this morning, the 9 a.m. service, we were $300,000 short for our Tulsa Dream Center pool, and we just started worshiping and praying, and one of the names of God is Jehovah Jireh, my God shall provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. I got a word for somebody who's believing for a car, who's believing for tuition. He is Jehovah Jireh in your season of lack. For some of you, you're up against a battle that's bigger than you. You know what his name is during that season? Jehovah Nisi, my banner of victory. He's my great defender. For some of you, you're the lost sheep. He's your great shepherd in this season. He's bringing you back. He's the father that waits on the front porch, running down the driveway to you. But in the 9 a.m. service, I was, I was starting to preach my sermon, and Daniel Henshaw ran up on stage, and he said, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but God just showed up, and someone just gave a check for $300,000. And it's not a faith check. It's a real check. 
Come on, you can take it to the bank. God just took care of the rest of the Tulsa Dream Center pool this morning. There's going to be kids this summer that are swimming and learning how to swim because Jehovah Jireh, my God, shall provide. He that dresses the lilies of the field, he watches over you. He looks out for the sparrows and he's looking out for you. There was a boy in the, in the lobby that came up to me right after the 9 a.m. service. He said, I was praying for my tuition to be paid for at Victor Christian School. And I just found out in this service that the same guy who paid for it last year is going to pay for it again this year. Someone's paying for me to go to Victory Christian School. He was so thankful. See, some of us in this room, we don't know what it's like to go without. And when you go without something and you're in a place of lack and you don't know how God's going to show up, you are so thankful when God shows up. Some of us don't know what it's like to need a defender because we've never been attacked like somebody else. But when you've been attacked and you need an attorney and you got the attorney in heaven who's pleading your case, who's standing before you and he sits next to the right side of God and he prays for you and he intercedes for you, that's when you need to know the names of God show up in every season. Jesus knew these disciples needed to have a revelation of God. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. He reminds you. He enlightens you. The memories. Number two, he enlightens the message. He shares with you what to say. This last week, Ash and I, we were with a group of pastors. And this one guy said, I've got a word for you. The Holy Spirit just gave me a word for you. This happens. Sometimes the words are interesting. I've had people give me words. And I've thought, oh, man, you got to test these words, you know. <laughs> How many of y'all ever had a word that you were like, I don't know. I don't know what to think about that word. Uh, someone came to me one time, not, this was a long time ago, when I was single, they said, I got a word for you. You're supposed to marry me. I said, I haven't gotten that word yet. I need a confirmation from two or three witnesses, and I get to choose who they are. I'm just kidding. But you know, some people give you words, and they try to manipulate you with their words and control you. But this guy had a word, and he said, I just feel like it's a pure word from heaven for you. And I said, okay. And he spoke it, and it was everything. This guy didn't know me from anybody. Didn't even know who I was. It was everything. Like he just details, even about my kids. He said, you have a kid. And, and he began to describe something in the last season. And man, I just, I said, that was you, God. The Holy Spirit wants to give you words that are going to help minister to people for what they're walking through. Last night, I was, I was praying for someone at the altar, and the Lord just gave me a word for him. You're just getting started. Just tears started flowing down his eyes. He said, I thought I was wrapping things up. I thought I was done. We're living in a time where the enemy wants to convince believers they're done. That you've, you've, you've seen your best days. You've sang your best song. You've seen your greatest. This is where the disciples were at. Jesus was leaving them, and they were like, you are our favorite friend. Our best friend is leaving us. Now we're going to go back to this upper room that you tell us we got to go back to, and we're going to stare at the empty seat of where our best friend used to sit. And you're telling us our best days are in front of us? We just saw our greatest years yet. We just spent three years with the Son of God, saw miracles, signs, and wonders. You gave us bread and fish. You paid our taxes out of a fish's mouth, right? I mean, they saw great things with Jesus, and he says, your best days are still in front of you. And, and we're in a season right now where people are wondering, what's God up to? And I, pr I just I felt like the Lord said to this man last night, you're just getting started. The best days of your ministry are right in front of you. And just tears started streaming down. Did you know Lester Sumrall, he, he, he made his greatest impact in his latter years of life it was in his mid to late 60s that he started Feed the Children. It was in his mid to late 60s. It was, Oral Roberts didn't build ORU in his 30s. See, this guy was like, you know, I'm past my 30s, I'm past my 40s, I'm past my prime. I don't know, I just kind of feel like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just you know, heading out, being pushed out to pasture, and maybe I'm done. And no, you're just getting started. It was in his mid 
or early, mid to late 50s that Oral Roberts started going to banks saying, I've got a university. It's in here. It's not out here yet. It's in here. See, the greatest, the greatest vision, it starts between the ears. The battle is between the ears. He could see it before he saw it. And he began to describe it. Banks didn't want to help him, but he kept pressing through. I'm so glad that Oral didn't hang his hat up at 58 years old and say, I think I've preached my best sermons. I've done my best things. I had crusades in California. I'll stop there. No, he said, I see a university. This last weekend, they graduated the largest graduating class at ORU, 918 students from a debt-free university where God is moving and the Holy Spirit is moving because someone said, God's not finished with me yet. Just because the world might put labels on you and say, you're done, you're disqualified, you're too old, you're too young, you're not the right person. You didn't graduate from the right school. You don't have the right skills. You came from the wrong family. Just because the world puts labels on you doesn't mean that God puts labels on you. God's looking for any man or woman who would say, Holy Spirit, use me. Holy Spirit, move through me. The Holy Spirit enlightens your memories, number one. It gives you the message to speak, what to say. Number three, your movements. He shows you when to go, where to go, who you need. In the book of Acts, we're going to find out the Holy Spirit is involved in every movement of the church. He literally tells Paul, don't go there. It's not time yet. You're not supposed to go to Asia yet, but I do want you to go here. And I need you to go talk to Cornelius. I need you to chase that chariot. And I need you to go and talk to these people. And you're, you're, you're called to stop doing ministry with this guy. It's not that he's bad. It's just that I've got him called to do some other things with some other people. And I need you to do some things with Silas now. Like, like the Holy Spirit wants to direct your friendships, wants to direct your relationships, and sometimes there's necessary endings that have to happen. It doesn't mean that someone's wrong or someone's off. It just means the Holy Spirit has assignments for each season, each person, and he's wanting to, he's wanting to spread the gospel across the earth. He's got a big vision, and the Holy Spirit, num uh, I want to tell you two things he does to energize you. Two things. Number one, he energizes you to preach with power. He energizes you to preach with power. If it's a heavy burden, it's not from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 38, he said, come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened, for I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is. The Holy Spirit wants to energize you by taking off burdens that you were never meant to carry. Can you imagine if I had to carry this pulpit, oh my word, this is heavy. Okay. This thing's, this is heavy. This is probably about a solid 75 pounds, maybe 150 pounds here. <laughs> <laughs> and can you imagine if I felt like I had to carry this everywhere I went? Like after service, I gotta go home. I gotta go play with my kids. And while I'm playing with them, I'm just, you know, carrying, carrying this pulpit. Come here, Mac. Come here, Liam. Guys, do y'all do y'all realize how ridiculous this looks? Do I look weird? Do I look ridiculous? Is the can the camera even catch this? We're, oh, the camera the camera doesn't even see me because I am squashed by this burden. I'm squashed. Some of you are carrying. No wonder you're exhausted. You're carrying something God didn't ask you to carry. If it's heavy, it's not the Holy Spirit. Okay, hold on. I might need some help. Pastor Ty, can you lift this thing off me? <laughs> okay. A little bit of help. A little bit of help now. <sighs> Will you stay here? When we're trying to carry the burden of the outcomes, it's heavy. Even during the pandemic, there was this there was, there was a lot of good things God was doing, but then there was this part of me that I felt like it was, it was on me for our church. And I was carrying this burden of the outcomes, like whether our church was going to make it through the pandemic. And, and one thing we all realized during the pandemic is we are not in control. <laughs> like we cannot control the mayor's decisions or the governor's decisions or the president's decisions. And that's a scary thing for control freaks. Some of us in, in the room, we were like, man, we can't control what our bosses do, what people do. 
And there were people that I really wanted to just stay at Victory that left. And I thought the outcome was my responsibility. And I was like, I need these people, you know. I'm in charge. It's my fault. It's my responsibility. No, no, no. When you're trying to carry the outcome of other people's decisions, you're going to feel heavily. You're going to feel so exhausted, drained, tired, confused, conflicted, trying to figure out, what did I do wrong? There's another burden. Ty, will you carry this? Is this heavy? Or is very, it just very heavy? Thank you. <laughs> well, well, it looks easier on you. No, it's not. <laughs> It's 300, I think. <laughs> this is getting heavier and heavier with each person that carries it. Now, let's call this the burden of outcomes. Let's call this the burden of obedience. Hold this. Much lighter. You can carry this. Much easier. This is easy, right? Because when I'm just focused on obeying God, I'm not in charge of the outcomes of people's decisions. You know, Ashley said something to me not too long ago. She said, you're carrying this burden of other people's decisions like it's your responsibility. Paul, your responsibility is right here. Pray, preach, do what you need to do. Apologize to whoever you need to apologize to. But you can't determine other people's forgiveness. That's too heavy of a burden for you to bear. You'll be spending the rest of your life trying to control other people's decisions. That's the burden of outcome. That is not your burden to carry. Your burden is obedience. Obey. Obey. Thank you, Pastor Ty. Um, I'm going to leave this down here because it's too heavy for me to carry. And I'm going to lay this at the altar. Let's leave it right there. Some of y'all need to lay some burdens at the altar today. If it's heavy, it's not from the Holy Spirit. He comes to energize you. He blesses you with a burden that's light. He blesses you with a burden. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have work to do. You still have work to do. I was talking with a guy in his early 20s the other day, and he said, I can't wait to retire. I said, what? When are you going to retire? He said, when I'm like 27. I was like, what are you going to do after that? He's like, nothing the rest of my life. And I was like, that sounds miserable, you know? I don't know. I just like to work, and I just like to be a part of, of being doing stuff and uh, building things and helping people and growing things. And, and I think God created us in his image put us in the garden and said, I want you to work this garden and multiply and be fruitful with your life. And so I was trying to talk to him. I said, you know, maybe you could do some other things, like start some businesses. And he was like, nah, just going to sit on the beach and retire at 27. <laughs> you know, we're living in a time right now where people don't want to work. But the Holy Spirit is looking for men and women who say, you know what? I want my life to count for eternity. So whatever I can do to make an impact, I'm going to go work at the Tulsa Dream Center. If you're going to retire, go do something that's fruitful for the kingdom of God. Go minister at Walmart. Go share the love of Jesus in the youth group. Become a mentor. Start a connect group. Join me. You know what? We're going to start prayer this Wednesday at noon right here for anyone who wants to pray. I just sense it's a season. It's a time to lean in and pray. We have prayer happening all throughout the week. We have a prayer room that's open every day. You could come early in the morning at 6 a.m., but on Wednesdays, for at least the next month or two months or three months, I'm going to be in here praying. And we're just going to turn on worship music in this room, and we are going to pray for our city. We're going to pray for churches. We're going to pray for pastors. We're going to pray for government officials. We're going to pray for our country, the countries of the world. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to move in revival. That's, that's, a, that's a light burden. Dr. Cho, who pastors the largest church in the world, they said, what's the secret to the success that God's given you in Seoul, South Korea. A million people come to their church every week. He said, I pray and I obey. Everything else is up to God. I pray and I obey. The results are up to God. The outcome is not my... Re Paul the apostle said this, some water, some sow seed, but the Lord is the Lord of the harvest. He's in charge of the outcomes, not us. The Holy Spirit energizes us to preach with power and to live the life he's called us to live, to move in the demonstration of the gospel. I want the band to come out. Let's keep reading. They said, when are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel in verse 6? They're, they're focused on a secular kingdom, a material kingdom. When are we going to get our country back from the Roman Empire? When are we going to overthrow the other political side? And Jesus said, you got it wrong. I'm not just here to try to restore a political kingdom. That's not my focus. My focus is to destroy the kingdom of darkness, the bondages that people are in, not just in Israel, but across the world. 
See, Jesus had a bigger vision than his disciples. They were thinking a nationalistic vision. He was thinking a global vision. They were thinking, we got, we got to get things right here. Jesus said, no, it's going to start in Jerusalem. But what's going to happen is the Roman Empire is going to oppress you. They're going to persecute you. You're going to go through suffering. There's going to be martyrdom. And the church is going to explode like crazy. Because where the enemy comes in and tries to threaten the church, the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus was telling his disciples, buckle your seatbelts. You're about to go on the greatest adventure of a lifetime. You can push for political power, but it's an empty life, he says. He who gains the world loses his soul, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, he's not saying don't get involved in, in the political landscape. He's saying be a part of it, but be a part of a bigger kingdom here. Be focused on driving out the spirit of darkness and bringing salvation to people, and bringing grace to people, and bringing the gospel to people. Go and preach the gospel to all the world, he was saying. He was saying, it's going to start in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth. He said, it's not for you to know the times. Timing is in God's hand. Some of us are trying to control the outcome of time. When you get married, when you have your first kid, when you get a promotion, when someone gives you a car, when you uh, get that certain thing that you've been waiting for, whatever it is. Jesus says, don't get focused on the timing of things. Just focus on preparing your heart for what God wants to do. How you wait is more important or just as important as what you're waiting for. And he says, but you will receive power. This is the key verse in the book of Acts. You will receive power. Everybody say power. Power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus goes up, and they're watching him. As we were coming back home on a plane this past week, I was looking at the clouds, and we had to go through some turbulence. We had to kind of go through a stormy spot, some really thick clouds, and the pilot knew exactly where to go. The pilot, you know, a really good pilot. He's, he's flown through storms before. I remember someone gave me a, a painting um, a couple years back, and it said, a smooth sea never made a skillful sailor. And it was a picture of this storm and the ship sailing through the storm. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> and uh, they were like, no, trust me. Like, you're becoming a better captain of the ship when you walk through stormy seasons. And... Um, and I think it's the same for a pilot. A smooth sky never made a skillful pilot. Good pilots and good captains, they don't have their ear to every person on the plane because every person on the plane has a different opinion. They're like, he should have gone left. He should have gone right. We should have gone down. Should've, we never should have taken off in the first place. You know, you, you know, when you're on a plane, you find out everyone's opinions. Get your mask on. Get your mask off. I'm not wearing a mask. You know, And right now, it's just interesting. Everyone's got different opinions. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I can feel it in the room. You even have different opinions about the fact that I just said we all have different opinions. You're like, I don't know what I think about that. I know what I think about that. You're going to talk about it at lunch, all your opinions. The world is never short on opinions. But a good pilot's not listening to all the opinions on the plane. He's focused on his mission. A good captain is focused on his mission. And he trusts the instruments. He trusts his training. He trusts those who've gone before him, those who've weathered storms years before him. And so, so Jesus is going up into the clouds. And I was reminded as I was on the plane this last week, I took a picture out the window. And there we were right above the clouds, right next to the clouds. And we kept flying and we got further up, higher above those clouds. And there was one spot where the clouds were so thick. There it is right there. The clouds were so thick. Below that was just this rainstorm. But above it was this beautiful sunrise, sunset. And, um, and I heard the Lord say, come up higher. Come up higher. This is a season. Some of you are in earthly circumstances, and God wants to give you a heavenly revelation. And I was reminded of Revelation 4, verse 1. John was exiled to the island of Patmos. He was the oldest, longest living disciple. They tried to kill him multiple times. They tried to burn him in boiling oil. They tried to stretch his body out. Multiple times, emperors tried to kill John. They couldn't kill John. He was so full of the love of God, he just couldn't be stopped. He was like the unbeatable disciple. Lived into his 90s, and he's writing on this island. He's been exiled to an island all by himself. 
Some of y'all are like, that sounds nice. I want to go to an island all by myself too. But he was there left to die, wild beast on this island. And while he's feeling alone, he's feeling discouraged, he's feeling overwhelmed, he's in an earthly circumstance, God gives him a heavenly revelation. God's calling us to see things from a different perspective. And he sees this in Revelation 4, verse 1. He says, after this, after what? After all the crud that I've walked through. After all the stuff. How many of y'all have walked through some stuff in the last year? Could have been your fault, someone else's. But he says, after all this, I looked up and there before me I saw a door that was open. We've got to learn to tap into the supernatural. This is where the Holy Spirit helps open our eyes. Lord, open the eyes of my understanding. He says, I saw an open door. And there was a voice that was speaking from heaven like a trumpet saying, come up higher, John. Not physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually. See things from a higher perspective. Come up higher and I'll show you what's next. I'll show you the interpretation of what you've been walking through. And I'll show you the prophetic vision of where you're headed. Because where the church is about to go, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind could conceive what God has in store. He's going to work all things together for your good. God's calling some of you to come up to a higher revelation of him. He's saying, come up higher. Come up above the clouds. Above the storm, above the rain, above the natural earthly understanding. You've been looking at this too close. And God's saying, come up higher. As Jesus began to ascend in the book of Acts, they were looking up into the sky. And they, they got stuck in a stare. Everybody say, stuck in a stare. It's important that when you get a heavenly revelation, if you're still living on earth, if there's breath in your lungs, you still got a mission in front of you. Don't get stuck in a stare. Get the vision and then move forward. They were stuck looking up there and two men dressed in white. I'm almost done. They said, why are you standing here looking there? Why are you standing here but you're stuck staring off there? I hear the Lord saying this to someone. Why are you standing in Tulsa, Oklahoma at Victory Church for such a time as this but you're staring somewhere else? And God wants to get your eyes back on the mission that he's called you. See, these disciples, they were staring off with a little bit of sadness. They were going, I miss you. I miss the good old days. They would go back to the upper room, and they'd have to find a replacement for Judas in this next chapter because he was gone. And there was, there was just this sense of loss. There was this sense of sadness. And they were staring off in this distance, missing how life once was. And the angel said, get your eyes back on who, stop looking at who left you and focus on who's with you. Stop focusing on what's missing and start focusing on where I've called you to be right here, right now. There's a mission, there's a message, there's a movement that God has for you. I want you to stand your feet all over this place. The next thing that would happen is they would go back to the upper room. And when they went back to the upper room, I was about to set this down on the podium and I realized it's not there. Um, as they went back to the upper room, it says in verse 12, they returned to Jerusalem and they went upstairs and they shut the door behind them. Some of you need to shut the door on distraction. Shut the door on opinions of everyone else. And it was Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, son of James. This was a different Judas. Y'all are like, I thought he was gone. This is a different one. And it says they all joined together constantly in prayer. I pray and I obey. Prayer is connecting with heaven. Prayer is releasing the will and the kingdom of heaven. Prayer refreshes you. Prayer encourages you. Prayer connects you with God's heart. They begin to pray, but they prayed in one accord. And they prayed for the answers to the questions they were facing. Like, who should we choose next to be in this group? And in that upper room, in that place of prayer, the miracle that God was going to bring them was already in the house. Some of you are waiting on a miracle, and God says, the miracle is in the house. The thing you've been looking for, it's already in the house. The stuff you've been waiting on, it's in the house. Their next disciple was already in the house. Not only that, but the evangelist of the New Testament, who would write 13 books in the New Testament, was already in the city of Jerusalem. His name was Saul of Tarsus. Don't look at things in the natural. They were judging a man by the way that man looks at man. But God was saying the miracle for the New Testament is not only already in the house, there's another one that's right inside this city. 
See, God was about to launch these disciples into a new season. They needed power. They needed a Holy Spirit revelation. Some of you are right now, you're at, you are literally at an intersection of fear or faith. You're at an intersection of whether you're going to go your way or God's way. And God's saying, lean into obedience. The outcome is not your responsibility. Obedience is. And if you will pray and follow the voice of God above all other voices, follow what God's asking you to do, lean into his heart. God's going to not only use you in great ways, he's going to connect you. He's going to line up favor for you. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you the grace you need. He's going to unlock the doors that no man could unlock. He's going to shut the doors that need to be shut. He's going to connect the dots for you. He's going to work all things together for good. I'm telling you, Pentecost is coming. Fire is coming. These disciples, they didn't know that back in that upper room, they were going to pray. It was going to feel normal to them. It was going to feel a little sad to them. Just because you don't have the feelings every Sunday doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not moving. Sometimes you got to stir it up when you don't feel it. They would go back to that upper room and they would pray. Jesus wasn't there anymore. He had already ascended in heaven. They'd look at that empty seat. They would cry. And then they would pray and cry. And they would pray and cry some more. And they would pray and cry some more. And then they would talk about it. And then they would eat and they would pray and cry some more. And then all of a sudden, tongues of fire appeared over their head. <sighs> the sound of a rushing wind began to blow through the windows. You've got to learn to wait with a fervency even when you don't feel like it. You've got to stir it up. See, God has greater things, but we've got to stir up our expectancy. We've got to not base our faith on what we've seen or what we feel, but on what we know. See, religion is about what you do. Relationship is about who you know. And when you're moving from a place of relationship, this is where Jesus was calling them. He says, I want you to know the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to be so inside you that you're going to hear his voice. You're going to know which way to turn. You're going to know which person to connect with. You're going to know what city to go into. You're going to know what sermons to preach. God wants us to move by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the next chapter after Pentecost, they would lay hands on a lame man. Even their shadows would walk past people and people would get healed. God wants to unlock the miracles of heaven to flow in and through his church. He wants disciples to move in power, to move in unity, to move in harmony, to move in one accord. I want us to close our eyes all over this place if you're here right now and you need a fresh touch from heaven. You're walking through some earthly circumstances. You need a heavenly perspective. You need God to pull off some burdens that you've been holding on to. Some of you have been carrying that 300 pound, that 300 pound pulpit over there and God God's saying, it's time to lay down that burden. It's time to trust me with your life. It's time to trust the Holy Spirit with what he's going to speak to you. Some of you need direction for this next season. You need a word from heaven. You need to know that you know that you've heard from God. Don't do anything without the, the unction of the Holy Spirit. He wants to lead you and guide you and comfort you and counsel you with heads bowed and eyes closed if you're here today and he's speaking to you. You want that. I want you to raise your hand across this room. You know God God's talking to you. Just leave your seat. Come and find a place at this altar. Come and lay it down at this altar. Some of you, you need to get your language back. You need to get that language of heaven back. You, wanna, you want the gifts of the Spirit. You're, you're hungry for the gifts of the Spirit. You knew it when you were a kid. You used, to, you used to hear that back in the, a long time ago. And God's saying, I want you to get that back. I want you to get that. Some of you have never seen it before. You've never heard it before. And maybe it feels strange to you. But God's saying, I want you to step into a new, higher level of understanding of the word of God. I want you to move by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to help you in everything you're walking through. See, God has a calling for you. He's not finished with you. You haven't seen your best days yet. You haven't sang your best song. You haven't written written your best song yet. You haven't preached your best sermon yet. You haven't met your best friends yet. God says, I've got new fresh things for you. I've got fresh seasons for you. I've got fresh songs for you. I've got greater days ahead for you. 
whatever you've walked through, whatever's been trying to steal your joy, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And through the Holy Spirit, he's gonna breathe fresh life. He's gonna restore what the devil tried to steal. He's gonna restore your confidence again. He's gonna restore your courage again. He's gonna strengthen your bones again. He's gonna strengthen your marriage. He's gonna strengthen your family. He's gonna cause that anxiety to leave you, that depression to leave you. As you get alone in that upper room, as you start praying, God's gonna start connecting the dots for you. Let's just begin to worship right here at this altar. Just ask for the Holy Spirit just to move in your life.
Just release that, that spiritual language. Release that song inside you. life to the barren womb 
says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on sons and daughters, men and women, the young and the old. It's multi-generational. It's every nation, every race. It's women and men. It's young boys and young girls. It's older men and older women. God says, I'm going to do something fresh in every, every generation across the church. now, God, just for every person out there that's running, that needs a second wind, that needs a fresh wind, a fresh fire today, that just needs to know that you are with them, you're for them, you're on their side. I pray for every person today that needs to know that you love them, you forgive them. God, every person who needs salvation today, if you need salvation today, just lift your hand up. If you need to just get right with God today, raise your hand. Today's your day. He forgives you. He loves you. He wants to save you. And then I know we've lingered long today, but I just feel like God is moving in your heart. He's moving in this place. And I just, I'm so thankful for the presence of God. So let's just pray together as a whole group today. Just say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I repent. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you that you rose from the dead. You are my risen Savior. And you've given me the Holy Spirit. So today, I receive the Holy Spirit. I want more of you, God. Flow in me and through me. Have your way. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm stepping into a new season with greater empowerment from the Holy Spirit. I'm all yours, God. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I love you, Victory.